Here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartsman. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, on as always with my partner, Dominic Tavella. Today is Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. Good evening, Dom. How are you? Doing well, Mike. Uh, the 17th already. The first two weeks are gone in January. Uh, how are you doing, Mike? Doing well so far. Yeah, I see you're back on Long Island and um, no snow so far. So knock on wood, middle of January, no snow. Let's keep it that way. Yes, please. And 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 the market's off to a to a pretty good start so far, Dom. The um the S P through Friday, and the market was closed yesterday for Martin Luther King Day. Um, the S P was is up four point two percent through the first two weeks. The Dow was up three point five four, and the Nasdaq so far is the big winner, up five point eight eight. And today was really interesting because the Dow was down about three hundred points. And the Nasdaq did well. You know, technology um, is mounting a little bit of a comeback. I don't know how sticky it is, but for now, I'll take it. Yeah, I, I look, uh, you know, we had a, a overall the fourth quarter was pretty decent. December was kind of rough. It, we gave back some of the, the earnings profits. Um, but then we got some momentum. Uh, maybe you want to call it a belated Santa Claus rally. Um, but I think to your point, Mike, it's really been a risk on trade. And so things that had gotten beat up the most technology specifically, but even something like Bitcoin um, has had a tremendous uh, first two weeks of the year. And it seems like investors uh, attitude, at least, is to put some risk back into their portfolios. And, and as such, uh, the NASDAQ particularly has done well. And the component of the S&P 500 that is growth and aggressive growth has done really well as well, uh, also. So, so it's been risk on since the beginning of January. Yeah, it's, really, it's amazing to me that you would have even have mentioned Bitcoin. We've been doing this for two years and I know how much you love Bitcoin. So I, I heard correctly. You actually mentioned Bitcoin, did you not? Yeah, I, I did. And and I think it's uh, obviously, but trying to prove a point where, you know, the things that have gone on in the cryptocurrency world and the bankruptcies and the layoffs. And uh, we all we know about this gentleman in the Bahamas who uh, his company had to file for bankruptcy. And and here you have an asset class, if you, if you want to call it that. I, I, again, we we don't touch it, Mike. We don't go near it. Right. But but had just gotten decimated uh, last year. Uh, if you had been an investor on it, you would have really gotten hurt. And it's one of the best performing asset classes uh, since beginning of January this month. And again, it's this risk on. I don't know where the appetite's coming from, but I have some some maybe delusions, illusions about it. But uh, it's been risk on, and that's a classic example of what are people thinking. But they are. They're buying it. Yeah, so look, that might that may or may not be a case of wishful thinking. We'll we'll know, you know, a couple of weeks and months. But I also think it was interesting. One of the worst categories last year was communication services, which used to be a part of the technology sector. A couple of years ago, they carved it out. Now it's the eleventh sector, and that is up eight point two percent. And last year, energy, as we all know, was the was the biggest winner. And, you know, now that's near the bottom, only up 2.7. Um, every sector is up this year other than healthcare, which is basically flat. So overall, Dom, the, the market or the, the year has gone off to a better start. There's still going to be some headwinds. You're still going to be the recession noise and the stuff we talked about last week with John McKay from Schroeder's. But so far, so good. Um, you know, the year has has gone off to a good start. And you're right. I think you use a perfect expression. Risk on seems to be, you know, back on the table. Yeah, Mike, I, I just want to focus on one particular point you just made, which is healthcare. Uh, we have been uh, overweighted healthcare for at least the last 12 months because it's a very defensive I hate to use the word safe, but very defensive sector of the markets i.e. we're all getting older, we're all going to need uh, drugs, we're all going to need knee replacements, we're all going to need... So healthcare, no matter what happens to the economy, tends to be a more stable uh, sector. Uh, earnings tend to be more stable. Yet this year so far, it's been one of the worst performing categories. So safe, <laughs> conservative, boring, 
underperforming and aggressive, speculative, way, in my opinion, overperforming. And I think that really has to do with what the Fed decision is going to be the latter part of this month, the first day in February. Um, and there's some speculation there as to what the Fed's going to do. And the markets are acting accordingly. We don't know yet whether that's right or wrong, but certainly risk off in the conservative, boring stuff, risk on in the more speculative growth stuff. And a part of me kind of hopes you're wrong because if the market is simply going up again, hopefully based on what, you know, the Fed, what Papa Bear says, is not, is not the background for a strong rally, Dom. Because if the Fed says something remotely disappointing, we wind up giving this all back. And, and that's the scary part of this conversation. And, and again, we, we're always brutally honest, Mike. We're not here to, to sugarcoat it. But we have seen this story before the last half a dozen times going into a Fed decision. The market does rally thinking that the Fed is finally going to make uh, a more softish plan going forward with their interest rate policy. Um, and clearly, you know, the Fed has disappointed the markets. Um, so there is that possibility, right? We have to be open to that this might be another cycle. Um, and therefore, yeah, we, we could give some of these gains back, or maybe all of them back. But I think longer term, and meaning at least the balance of this year, the picture does look healthier than it did a year ago this time. Um, and I think we have to take a, a more longer term approach to this in general. Um, but don't be surprised short term if, um, you know, the cycle continues this volatility up and down. You know, and, and from that perspective, I could not, I could not agree with you more. You know, long term, all of 2023, based on what we know right now, it does. We 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 do believe that 2023 will be a better year, simply because the things we worried about last year are either beginning to go away, come into focus, interest rates, inflation. You know, the last one obviously is a recession. The job market, we hear about the job market all the time. Um, and, and as those things, you know, one way or another start to resolve themselves, then I do think risk on for the long term is more sustainable because, Dominic, I always maintain the tech sector is also very psychological. And if those big fang stocks, right, whether it's Facebook or Amazon or Apple, Netflix or Google, if they're doing well, I just think overall, Dominic, investors are in a better mood. Well, and let's remind people, Mike, those companies that you just mentioned are a big percentage, a big component of the S&P 500. They represent a very significant amount in total value of the mm -hmm. S&P 500. So it's very difficult for the S&P overall to perform well if that sector does not. Right. Um, and look at the things we were looking at a year ago, where the inflation was still rising. We didn't even know if, when, if ever, it was going to crest. And it looks like that happened in June. We were very concerned about a recession. We were supply chain. Uh, there, there's so many headaches and problems that today seem like we're in a much better place. And the Fed's told us they will stop their interest rate hike sometime soon. Um, so I think we, if we take a longer term view to this, there'll, there'll be some terrific opportunities for us to take advantage of. What happens in the next two weeks might be a little bit more volatile than the average person wants, but we'll get through this one too. And by the way, and I'm, and I'm, I'm happy you didn't mention it because it's not on as many people's minds as it was, but last year at this time, we were also through this enormous second or third COVID wave. I mean, the numbers last year at this time, people coming down with COVID was astronomical. And yes, they were not dying, thank God. They were not being hospitalized, but they weren't at work, right? And that obviously slows down productivity as well. And that, and that although we having a little spike now, people aren't thinking about it and living their lives based upon it as they were a year ago. 
And Mike, just think that we didn't know the severity a year ago, right? The new mm-hmm. wave was coming in and people were like, well, this, well, this one be worse, you know, so, so that we, a lot of unknowns are off the table, a new set of unknowns are coming in and we have to think about and earnings and a company is going to be able to grow their earnings and unemployment numbers still going to stay relatively uh, low. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, it's always a moving target for us in our world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for, for, for myself, I think you as well on the same page, it's telling clients, don't let the volatility frighten you. We're, we're through, I think, the worst of this. Um, and maybe if we did have some volatility, think of it as an opportunity, right? Think of it as an opportunity maybe to gather some assets, some shares of companies uh, at a discounted price that maybe down the road, we'll be happy we bought them. Don, we have a fun show tonight. We have Ty Burr who is actually a film critic and pop culture columnist for the Boston Globe for for two decades, for 20 years. And now he writes the Ty Burr Watch List, um, which is a a popular newsletter for movie and TV recommendations. So tonight we're going to get into, you know, we always have to make it a little bit about business, kind of the business of movies. And then Ty also said if we wanted to, we could talk about some of the films that have been made over the years you know, are about Wall Street and about business. So um, we're really anxious to have Ty on tonight and, uh, you know, get his point of view about all things movies and um, as they relate to what we do for a living as well. Yeah, a little change of pace, right? We can't always talk about P.E. ratios and sharp deviation and all kinds of wonky stuff. But uh, we'd like to inject some uh, some humor, hopefully, and, and, and some good ideas and give people a different perspective. So we'll be right back with Tyburn.com. Now, back to the Laventhal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, back with my partner, Dominic Tavella, and our special guest this evening, Ty Burr, the author of the Ty Burr Watch List, which can be found at tyburrwatchlist.substack.com. Good evening, Ty. How are you? I am well. How are you? Welcome, Ty. Thank you. Good to be so, Ty, here. since we are a financial show and we will get into some of the fun stuff, I just want to get into a, a quick business question about sure. you know the making of movies. You know, Dominic and I have been doing this a long time, and 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 maybe 30, 35 years ago, investors will offer the ability to make an investment in a movie. Right? There were there were there were limited partnerships at the time. And a, a brokerage firm that's no longer in existence um, were offering these things. And they had what was called multiple write-offs, meaning right. if you invested $10,000 and it failed, you could write off five times that expense. And ultimately, this fad, thank God, went away. But I guess my question is, when a, a small investor is invited to make an investment in a movie, what's the likelihood? of them ever making money on that, on that movie. Nil. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you tell us what you really feel? (laughs) (laughs) I would say that, you know, every now and then you get a, because that level of filmmaking um, is, is independent. It's not, you know, the studios aren't going around shaking down small time investors. Um, for that kind of movie, that kind of small independent movie to break out, to become a hit at Sundance, to become, to pick up a real distributor, to get to theaters, um, or these days get to streaming, it's difficult. Um, you know, it can happen. Last year, this movie, you know, the movie that won Best Picture last year, Coda? I don't know if you mm-hmm. ever saw it. Um, the one about the deaf family in, in, in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Really sweet little movie, tiny little movie. That one, you know, if you'd happen to have invested in that, you would have done okay. Um, that is so far the exception to the rule that um, I honestly, when I listen to that that idea about, you know, you can get five times the write off, it's kind of like the producers, you know, it's, it's more in your interest to produce a movie that's destined to fail. So it's springtime for Hiller, bring it on. Yeah, uh, I'm just everyone got fifty percent of the profits, <laughs> right? <laughs> All thirty-three investors. Um, <laughs> but but you know we see that on a larger scale, right? Whether it's the Disney's or the Netflixes, they they're trying to make these movies and actually make money on them. It's incredibly difficult for any of these firms to actually make money on them, right? 
Right. But if, you know, the, the, the gamble is, and this is why studios existed and why they still exist, is that one or two big hits can cover your losses. Um, so, you know, Paramount comes out with Top Gun 2 Maverick, you know, I, I, one out of every 10 movie theater tickets sold in 2022 were to that one movie. Wow. So that will tell you, A, how depressed the box office is still uh, after three years of pandemic, but also how how powerful one blockbuster can be. In, so, it, can I expand on that, Mike? Just for yeah, a go second. ahead, please. Oh, only because I watched that movie literally sitting in an airline seat on the back of somebody <laughs> else's head and the sound was really terrible. But Not there's the so many different avenues now for right. these companies to get the product out there, right? Whether it's Correct. streaming and uh, 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 Netflix or, or uh, their uh, theaters, obviously. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about all these different revenue sources or ways they can try to make money off these movies? Yeah, well, one of the things that the, um, that the major studios and really the major corporations that now have a studio in their portfolio, um, the, one of the ways they're, they're making money and they've really sort of turned their attention to this in the last three, four, five years is streaming platform. And every major studio, every major corporation has started its own streaming platform because they've looked at the success of Netflix and Amazon Prime and they look at all this content they own. And it's like, why aren't we getting into that business? So now you've got um, you know, Paramount Plus and you've got the Peacock Network, uh, network which is universal. Um, you've got Disney Plus, of course, and HBO Max, which is Warner Brothers. Um, and they are, it, Disney reorganized itself uh, like four years ago, three years ago around Disney Plus. So no longer it's the theatrical release of a movie, the horse that's leading the cart. Um, it really is a radical reformation of the entertainment landscape. Um, and they're putting all this effort into, it's a totally different economic model. It's no longer just selling a ticket. It's getting people to subscribe, pay that monthly subscription for their streaming platform. And it's really changing, A, the kind of movies that get released, where they are released, how they get released, where you see them. Um, and right now it's, it's a total mess. Everybody's, nobody knows anything. And, uh, and I think the audience, the consumer um, is terribly confused uh, by all these options and, and they can't afford all of these different channels. Um, and I, I predict a shakeout, I predict a consolidation. And, you know, maybe we'll go back to three networks or some version thereof. So you mentioned Hulu and Netflix tie. Yeah. And one thing I've always was curious about, are they, are they truly putting up like I'll use the, the the film The Irishman, which came out mm -hmm. came out right before the pandemic with De Niro and Pacino. It was a big budget movie. Yeah. I, um, what are, are these streaming services doing all the backing on those productions, or or do do, do they have the backing of other investors? Because I can't imagine you have enough subscribers to pay for many of those huge blockbuster productions like that. Yeah, but but they're not paying for the blockbuster. But they're paying for the service. They're not. You, know, you have to remember they're paying a monthly fee for everything. Um, and Netflix is just making crazy money when you consider how many people are paying that fourteen ninety nine or four ninety nine or whatever tier you're on. Um, so yes, they have money to throw around. And there's two ways that the streaming platforms who are doing this, who are putting out original uh, content, um, are getting it. They're either picking it up at film festivals, um, like that movie Coda that won the mm -hmm. best picture that showed at the Sundance Film Festival a year and a half ago, or actually uh, two years ago now. And um, and uh, Apple Apple TV picked it up. And so it showed there. And, and they marketed it as an Apple movie. It wasn't, it was a pickup. Um, on the other hand, uh, Netflix, which again has crazy money, did in fact bankroll The Irishman. Um, and did in fact bankroll a movie, uh, Roma, the Mexican film that was up for a bunch of uh, Academy Awards. And they know that those movies are not gonna get big audiences. Um, they're almost like loss leaders. They'll get press, the critics will like them. They'll get attention, they're, they're, they're brand you know, polishers. Um, and the, the Irishman, are, I would ar actually argue, which I think is a very good movie, but not a, a movie to watch at home because it's 
very slow on purpose and very character oriented on purpose. And if you're looking at your phone and getting up to take a leak and, you know, you know doing whatever, it, it's going to break the spell. That's a movie you need to see in a movie theater. Nevertheless, I also think Netflix has been burned on those and is starting to back off. And they've publicly said we're we're not going to be spending as much money on original movies as we were. So Ty, in a comment made earlier with a con consumer is confused, right? There's so many services now and so many subscription fees. And we saw it, you know, in the pr price of Netflix stock, which last year lost some 60, 70%. The price of Disney stock, hmm. the stalwart Disney, I think stock was down, what, 50%, Mike? And yeah. I can rattle off another half a dozen where, right. uh, you know, the consumer's getting going enough is enough. I can't afford it. or I'm not spending three, four, five hundred dollars $500 a month on services. Uh, what do you see as the future here? Yeah, and 2022 was the wake-up call for the streaming revolution. It was a kick in the pants. Um, Netflix had that quarter where they lost subscribers, which you know was unheard of, and 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 their stock tanked. Um, what do I see as uh, you know? <laughs> we're at the we're at a period where nobody knows anything. That wonderful sort of period where the technology is there, but nobody knows what works. It's like the beginning of the sound era, you know, or when TV first came in. Nobody knows what the golden you know formula is. Um, I do foresee a, consol a shrinking, a consolidation within the individual streaming platforms. They're not going to be bankrolling as many TV shows. They're going to be, you know, doing more pickups, maybe the, of content that's already made. Um, they're um, they're going to be pulling in their heads a little bit. But the larger issue is, I don't think there's a market out there for all these different services, and. I don't know how that's going to shake out. I don't know who's going to cry uncle first because these are deep pocketed corporations and they know that there is, you know, um, if you can get a couple of million people paying that monthly, you know, it's free money. And, and also aren't all these net, aren't all these streaming services challenged to get content and get, and get talent to work for them because and being good content. Yeah. Right, be, be, because you know you, who who are the movie stars now? Because the <laughs> movie stars have options now to maybe make the I don't know if they're called miniseries, but yeah. you know these 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 longer seven eight nine episode shows that I think have a little more runway to be successful. Right, um, and you know one of the, the great things about the last ten years is, you know, it has been a golden age for TV. The quality of writing has been astonishing. The quality of, of you know, the shows, the directing, the acting, all of it, it, to the point where, you know, back when you and you guys and I were young, TV is, was where movie stars went to die, basically. It's mm -hmm. where, you know, when your career was over, that's where you'd go do a TV If you did a TV series, series you would die. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and collect your res residuals and go retire. And that's not true anymore. If anything, the game has changed movie stars don't have the clout that they do in part because the studios are selling franchises. They're selling intellectual property. So Thor is a star, not Chris Hemsworth. Um, you know, uh, and Tom Cruise can sell a movie if it's a Top Gun movie. Um, and Steven Spielberg can sell a movie in a big hit in theaters if it's Indiana Jones, but The Fablemans, which is a great movie, nobody's going to see it in theaters in part because it's, uh, it's an older appeal movie and older viewers are not going to, to the movies nearly as much as they used to. You know, you you said something which I and we're we're all bumping against a break, but you said something just now which really crystallized, you know, the the, the superhero genre, where in the last Spider Man, the old Spider Man showed up. Yeah, those right? are the stars, right? But only right. within that little frame, right? Which is kind of like making making fun of themselves that they're not the stars. Spider Man's the star. That's right. That's right. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's got to be tough for, for actors. Um, you know, who's the star anymore? He, I'm refreshed to know, hear that Tom Hanks, the movie that he just came out with, A Man Called Otto, is actually doing quite well in theaters. Um, so, you know, maybe he's the last star. I don't know. I read the book, The Man Called Avi, and I yeah. love the book, and I can't wait to see the movie. But look, we're bumping up against a break. We're going to take okay. a quick break, Ty. And when we come back, let's talk about some Wall Street and business movies that, 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 that you enjoyed. Okay, sounds good. We'll be right back. Um, now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, back again with Dominic Tavella, my partner, and our guest this evening, Ty Burr, author 
of Ty Burr's watch list. Ty, why don't we just spend a few minutes, talk about your watch list and how they came to be and give us the name of, of the uh, website again. Sure. Um, it's tybearswatchlist.substack.com. It came about, I'd been at the Boston Globe for 20 years. I was a writer for Entertainment Weekly for 11 years before that. I've been in the business a long time writing about movies. And about a couple of years ago, I started realizing that the way that the media, meaning newspapers and magazines, covered movies was no longer the way we watched them. Um, and there was kind of just a disjunction between when a movie came out and when it was reviewed and when people actually started seeing it on demand or wherever. And, and the other thing that occurred to me was that everybody has Netflix. A lot of people have Amazon Prime. A lot of people have Hulu, HBO Max, um, whatever, Apple TV. Nobody all has of, any All of the above. Yeah. Or all of the above. And nobody has any idea what's on them, um, aside from whatever the top tier is when you, you're on the home screen. And they need some guidance. And there's, you know, they have a deep, deep bench of content. So my newsletter, like two or three times a week, you get an email from me um, saying, here's what's, here's a new movie in a theater. Here's an old movie on demand, um, just leading you to good movies. Uh, and I've had pretty good success. I've got tens of thousands of, of subscribers. It's free. If you pay, you get um, uh, some extra content and the ability to comment and join the conversation. And, um, it's been really fun turning people on to some good movies below their radar uh, that they you know, it might have it may have just come out that but they might not have heard of. Um, did you know there was a new Fletch movie out? No. Okay, no. with John Hamm from Mad Men, it's called Confess Fletch. It was released to theaters and, and not even marketed, and then went straight to home to video on demand. It's really good. I recommend you you check it out. It came out about. I don't know, five months ago. Mm -hmm. It's really funny. And John Hamm has a, has a blast. Which, ser that. Hi, which service? Um, I think it's available. You know, hold on, I'll check. It's it's available on multiple services. So you can rent it for like $2.99 or something here. I'll, I'll check. There's a wonderful site that you, you and your listeners should know called justwatch.com. And you plug in a title and it tells you what service it's on. Well, that's helpful. Yep. Um, Confess Fletch is... Yeah, it's streaming on Showtime, but you can also rent it for 10 bucks on Amazon, Apple TV, a couple of other places, YouTube. All right, thank you. Thanks for the recommendation. Sure. So let's talk about some Wall Street and some business movies. Um, so, Anna, can, can I just finish quickly? Yeah, so well, I'm sorry. That's what I'm doing. So if you go to tiberswatchlist.substack.com, you can sign up for it and you'll start getting the emails. That's it. That's that's my plug. I, I, I apologize. No, um, not at all. So let, let's let's talk about some of your favorite or or not so favorite um, <laughs> Wall Street slash business movies. I was thinking about this, and that's a good little genre, and it goes back a while. Um, you know, uh, I think in the last twenty years we've had this a, a run of just good Wall Street business movies that play up how nasty the the, the game can get. Um, you know, and I'm I'm thinking of, you know, the big short. I'm thinking of The Wolf of Wall Street, obviously. Um, Wall Street goes, I mean, that that movie's now how old that movie's like. And a classic. Old. Yeah, it is. It is a classic. But, you know, uh, Boiler Room, remember Boiler Room with an mm -hmm. early movie for Vin Diesel about uh, the you know, young traders. Um, there was a really terrific movie that came out of the, um, not the only good thing that came out of the 2008 meltdown, uh, a movie called Margin Call. I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, with Zachary Quinto about literally the night everything goes to hell. Um, it's got a really terrific cast. Um, and then, you know, it's actually the subject makes for surprisingly good TV and TV series. And I'm thinking of um, shows like Billions. Billions um, is a really popular one in succession. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then some you get of the it based on real life characters. Wink, right. Wink. Uh, and oh, then yeah. you get the office, which yeah. is sort of like the the flip side, the satirical flip side of of, of business. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there, and and I was also thinking that we've had the last year or two, we've had this really interesting run of startup scandal series. Um, uh, we crashed about uh, the mm -hmm. we work people, um, the dropout about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, uh, and super pumped about the guys who started Uber. Yeah, yeah watch that one. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. What do you think it is that makes people want to watch, you know, 
basically business failure, high profile business failure. You know, to me, to me, they make these characters so unlikable. Mm. Right. And, and, and the other part of it, which would be a little frustrating for us is some, you know, they, you know, they cut a lot of corners, obviously, and some of the descriptions are not, they're just not realistic. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. In Ozark, Marty is a stock, he's a, he's, he's a stockbroker before he becomes this mastermind <laughs> criminal. And, and in one scene, he's trying to convince someone to transfer their account to him. And he gives them like two sheets of paper to sign. And next thing you know, it's Marty's account. And I'm watching with my son. And my son's like, that's not how it works. You can never get, you know. So so we have to, I guess like a medical show, if we were doctors, have to take a step back and realize that they're not really, they're dealing with the premise, but they're not dealing with reality. Right. It's more about, I think, cult of personality that makes them popular. Right. It's the characters. And it's and in the case of Succession, it's people you love to hate. Uh, and, uh, you know, yes. what I love about Succession is, you know, everybody has their character who they kind of love, hate the most. You know, and, I mean, obviously, the characters are larger than life. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. But, you know, you think about it and uh, I think Mike is spot on. We have clients coming back. And I'm like, well, it happened on billions. Why can't you do it? Like, well, oh, <laughs> the God. world doesn't really work. Like no. that, at least, at least not for us. You know, we tend we tend to be in a little bit of a different league. Uh, we don't run a hedge fund, but but you know, the average person out there hopefully enjoys it, but hopefully understands that not entirely based on reality or, or uh, it is there for entertainment purposes, right? right? Probably not. Like Michael says, you know, I, I and I know this. You know, doctors look at medical shows or med medical movies and goes, it's not like that. I know as as a journalist, you know, I look at Spotlight, you know, which is a movie that actually took place in my newsroom, the newsroom mm -hmm. I worked in with people I know. And I, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's always got to be dramatized. It always has to be streamlined. And, and I, I guess, I guess the last, the, 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 the last example, it, well, not, not the last example, but would, would you consider a movie like uh, a nine to five? Which is a which is a comedy? Would you consider a movie like that a a, a business movie or yeah. or not really? Yeah, no. There's office place comedies and office place satires. The Office, obviously, Office Space, the movie. If you've ever seen that, you know that that is the ultimate office satire. Um, and I think Nine to Five, for its time and place, absolutely falls into that. Um, and you know, there's there's a history of a. Have you ever seen The Apartment with Jack Lemmon? Yes. Yeah. That to me is maybe that's like the first modern business movie about the modern, you know, it's, it's like the first office space um, where you are looking with a very jaundiced eye at that office hierarchy and what you have to do to get ahead. And in Jack Lemmon's case, have to give away his apartment so his, his superiors can go have their afternoon affairs in. You know, Ty, I, I realize, you know, movies like The Wolf of Wall Street or The, the Big Short, I mean, they're there in, in I think both movies tried to tell a really true story, but it, they also mm -hmm. painted Wall Street in general in a very negative uh, way. Do you think that it affects people and their investment attitude sure. and what their beliefs are about Wall Street? And is it a fair system? Um, in the same way, you're never going to get a or rarely going to get a a feel good hero film about a lawyer. Um, you're probably not going to often get a feel good hero movie about a hedge fund manager. Uh, there are just these, these um, caricature, social caricatures we like to hold up as uh, bad guys for, for better and for worse and not as a, you know, a reflection of reality, unfortunately. Um, we're drawn to stories about the people, you know, I'm, I'm, I was thinking there's gonna be an FTX miniseries about Sam Bank. Oh, you, that, that, that one's already, I think, already been written, right? I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is because we want we want to see those people fall and fail. And you know, no, it's it's not fair to the, you know, the millions of honest people that work in the industry. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's the, they were the way we organized humanity into stock figures. Um, you know, every now and then you do get a good, I would like to see a, a positive uh, investor movie. Um, I, ha I have one for you. What it would look like. I have one for you. Okay. 
the pursuit of happiness. Ah, yes, with Will with Will Smith. With Will Smith, and I actually met the real person that movie was based upon. Uh, huh, huh. You're so right. It was mean, a homeless, sort of a homeless, yeah. literally a homeless person yep. with a young son who was determined to get a job in Wall Street and did it. Given an opportunity and he became successful. Very yep. successful. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. That's good. And it's one of the few ones. One, you know what <laughs> just occurred to me? One of the business movies I've seen, or a movie about a businessman that could villainize him more, but actually kind of plays a really interesting line down the middle is, is the founder. Which is about Ray, Roy Kroc, Ray Kroc, um, uh, who of uh, McDonald's, has played by Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. It's a movie that came out about I don't know ten years ago, um, and it really is about how he was this traveling salesman who saw what the the McDonald brothers were doing and just came in and took it over and took yeah. it over up from under them in ways that kind of was not great for them. And the movie is interesting in that it kind of looks at what he does and says it was pretty reprehensible, but it's also kind of the guy was a great businessman. Um, and that's a really interesting tone. It strikes. It's a very good movie. And I don't think a lot of people have seen it. Like Dominic, I saw that one on, actually, I saw that one on a, on a, on a plane as well. And I actually enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, let me, let me ask you this. The, the um, classic, Orson Welles movie, Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that a business movie or not really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the same way that Succession is a business movie, they're both about media tycoons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one's basically a, a gloss on William Randolph Hearst and the other is a sort of fake um, uh, Rupert Murdoch, but they Oops. are about, they're both about the personal life of somebody with immense business power um, in ways that show how hollow that life is. And again, you know, true or not, it's a story we like to hear. Look, I, I think uh, we can do this with hopefully a little sense of humor about it, but it is relevant to what we do every day, Mike. And we look at some of these companies and what's going on out there. And, and uh, we just talked a lot about streaming and, and the value of a company and, and it does change valuation. So it's very, very relevant to what we do all day long. It is. It is. And, and I find very interesting. What do you guys think of um, the situation with AMC theaters uh, or two years ago now, where they were kind of being, they were go, heading toward bankruptcy and they were a bit up almost as an internet prank. Um, so, does that? Yeah. So that was the beginning of our, our podcast show it was two years ago. And, uh -huh. and we spent several shows talking about those meme stocks. That's what, yep. that's what they were called. And, you know, that's kind of for us, Ty, and I'll let Dom comment as well. That's kind of the, the, the underbelly, the dark side of what we do mm -hmm. is when certain people corrupt investing and make it seem like, you know, it's it's it's, it's a, a game. It's a croupier right. yeah, that we're croupiers or, you know, it's it's DraftKings and it's mm -hmm. not. And that's what that's what AMC was like. It's like betting on the on the Cowboys last night. Right, right. Yeah, so okay. what happened? Where are they now? I've lost track of that stock. What Three dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the the reality is that they they took on a lot of debt to try to survive. Um, they sold a lot of shares of stock again with, to the effort of trying to survive. And at this point, the amount of debt outstanding is way more than the total value of the company. Right. So, right. will they survive? Can they survive? Um, uh, we don't know. And it's, it's it's a hard call to decide. That's not something that um, myself or Mike actually do. But it speaks to this idea that that these companies and we, we mentioned Netflix and we mentioned Disney, but this is another one that valuations matter based on real revenues. Yeah. Right. Not make believe fantasy numbers. And the reason Netflix and you brought it up dropped in value is because the number of people subscribing to their services drop. Same thing with Disney. Their, their subscription service hasn't gone quite as well uh, as they had hoped. And the company you just mentioned has had other issues and difficulties. So valuations matter, but they matter based on what the company real revenue uh, or subscription uh, levels are. Right. And the theatrical, the brick and mortar theater multiplexes are in, in, a, in a hard place because I actually was just reading a report that came out today that uh, older audiences are just not coming back. 
Um, and that, you know, this year's box office, I think was 60% of um, pre-pandemic levels. But again, as I said, one out of every 10 tickets went to one movie. Mm -hmm. And that's not a sustainable business. And and AMC theaters, I know, I know on Friday they're releasing a movie that will only play in theaters. Um, it's called Alice Darling. It's got Anna Kendrick. I think they're aiming it at at um, Gen Zers and millennials. And I don't know if that's a good business strategy either. It's just like we're the only people that have this movie, but it's got to be a big enough movie to really move the needle. And I'm not sure that that is going to do it. And I just want to be clear to our listeners. I just checked where you were speaking. The stock is six dollars for some reason, mm -hmm. but but I guess the point is about marketing to Gen Zers. Is they're the ones you're still going out and you know have less fear about COVID. So maybe there is some logic. You know, they're, they're the ones who are going to the movie theater anyway. So might as well just market to them. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry about it's, that thirty-second commercial tie, but when I hear making a market call on a, a Disney or a Netflix or. Uh, AMC, what we're saying is that valuations, values of these companies, stocks in general, normally are tied to some kind of a revenue stream. And the Correct. reason why some of these companies have faltered or, or the value of their stock has dropped is, I think, directly related to that revenue stream. Correct. Yeah. And the time, the, the, back. The time flew by. Um, we are out of time. Why don't you give us that website one more time? Spell it out for us. Sure. Um, so our listeners could subscribe if they'd like to. It is tiberswatchlist.substack.com, T-Y-B-U-R-R-S-W-A-T-C-H-L-I-S-T dot substack.com. Um, and you can sign up for it for free. And like I said, you'll get um, uh, an email pointing you to some good stuff, hopefully. Ty, we enjoyed this conversation. This time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. We'll be right back after this. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman, back with Dominic Tavella for a quick wrap-up. So, Dom, two weeks ago, we had uh, Muppets in Moscow, and, and tonight we had a real-life movie critic from the Boston Globe. So I'm glad we're able to bring you know various content to our listeners and clients and, and tie it back. So what we do, I think it's important. Yeah, Mike, uh, again, we can we can joke about it. Maybe a little humor is always good. But the Muppets was about international investing and how everybody on the planet needs. Uh, you have to have money overseas. You have to invest overseas. You have to include international as part of your portfolio. But look at the perils that one has to overcome. And tonight, oh, my God, this company is cheap. That company is cheap. Look how much it's, it's sold off. Well, there's a reason why these companies sold off. And there's a, a, the confusion in the consumer market today and streaming is really huge, Mike. I think it will settle out. And I think it does, has to. There are too many services charging way too much. And at the end of the day, there'll be winners and losers. But there's a real reason why some of these stocks are down 50, 60, 70 percent from their all time highs. And there's look, there's too many choices. Right. And in, in movies now, I remember when, you know, HBO and, and Showtime came about, you waited at least nine months to a year for a movie to go from the movie theater to television. Now it's, it's either simultaneously or straight to streaming. So the whole the whole um, the Business whole model, model has changed completely changed. And look, uh, the streaming services are one discussion. But what does it say about movie theaters? And how often will the average person go back to a theater? And I'm not saying people will never go to a theater again, but will they go off as often? Um, that, that's a really important question going forward. I think, Dominic, I think as long as this pandemic is hovering, um, look, I talk to clients every day and they'll say to me, I'm not going out or I can't get my spouse to go out. They're not going to restaurants. They're not going to restaurants. They're not going to malls. Guess what? They're not sitting in a petri dish of a movie theater with with you know eighty strangers for three hours. It's just not happening. Uh, look, uh, there's obviously some of that going on, Mike. But look at you know from I look at myself and my lifestyle and the convenience of being able to sit in front of my own TV, big screen TV and watch a movie. And all right, maybe it doesn't have the sound quality. Maybe it's not quite as large a screen, but you go, you know what? I'll, I'll live with it. I'm good. I, you know, I, I don't have to get in a car. I don't have to drive anywhere. I don't have to sit in a movie theater. The convenience factor, maybe the quality is not as good, but I'll live with that. 
I can you look. Know, the one thing, Dominic, that I didn't bring up with Ty, you and I go to a lot of portfolio meetings. We've been doing it for decades. And I remember 20 years ago being in the audience and a portfolio analyst said, Blockbuster will be out of business in 10 years. 10 years. At the time, they were a huge publicly traded company. They, they probably had thousands of stores nationwide. I would go there with my kids every weekend to rent something or, oh, or yeah. another. We joke, we still joke about getting fine, hope hopefully finding, talk about bait and switch, and you could run in to get that one title. And no, nope, sorry, somebody else, somebody else just checked it out. So here's this guy. And he like right on right on time, basically 10 years later, Blockbuster was basically gone, right? So every now and again in our business, we do get to see the trends and we do get to, you know, get a sneak peek. And um, it was really interesting how that model completely turned over in really a very short period of time. And what we're seeing today, Mike, is the streaming services, right? Now, active uh, activist investors are stepping into some of these companies and saying, you need to change your business model. And some of these companies are starting to, but I come back to there's a reason why the valuation of some of these companies are down 50, 60, in some cases, even more percent from their all-time high. We're not all shuttered in a house anymore. We can go out, we can have choices, we can do other things. And the total number of streaming services has to come down. So there'll be mergers, there'll be acquisitions, there'll be out now bankruptcies, but the business model there is broken and we'll see what the outcome is. You know, Ty said it, and I we hear it frequently that this has been the golden age of TV or the golden age of movies. I would argue, Dominic, it's almost too much content. Right. There's almost too many, almost too many choices. Um, without a doubt, Mike, I think you were 100% correct. Too many choices. But now let's focus on quality choices. And we, we rattled off a few during our interview with Ty. There's a limited number of quality choices. And this comes back to some of these companies basically now having franchises, which will be very profitable for them. What does it mean for everybody else? I don't know. And and you mentioned on the break, you know, the, the the show Yellowstone, and and I think you said it was Paramount, and and whether it's um, you know, Netflix, um, what, what was that name of that that the the Korean show that was super popular, um, Squid Games, Squid yes, Squid Games. You just need one. Right. To, yeah, to, to it, get it, a, it, eyeballs uh, on one streaming service. Yellowstone. And I think you are right, Mike. I think it is Paramount. But whoever, uh, Yellowstone has been a huge success. I don't know that they, when they first released this thing, they even had a dream that it might be this successful. So it can be. If you hit it, it could be, you know, literally winning lotto for some of these companies. But few and far between. They're not, they're not every series coming out by every one of these networks. I know. I know. Listen, we are out of time. What a shocker. <laughs> but we'll be back here next week, Mike, and uh, try to do it all over again. We will be back next week. Everybody stay safe, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Great evening, all.